Yo, this is Alex Burkett, and you're listening to the Long Game Podcast. In this episode, I'm talking to Morgan Brown. Morgan is the VP Growth at Shopify, and previously acted as a Director of Product at Facebook and COO at Inman News. I met him when he was at Growth Hackers with Sean Ellis. He and Sean literally wrote the book on growth, titled Hacking Growth, which you should definitely read. So of course this conversation covers growth extensively. What it is, how does it work, what do the team structures look like, and importantly, how does it work with content and SEO? We also discuss the idea of terminology dilution and whether this term growth, growth hacking, growth marketing, whether it's even useful anymore. We also talk about what it's like to write a book as well as tips for doing so and cover some of Morgan's longer term goals and ambitions and drives as well. Morgan's awesome and you're gonna learn a ton in this episode. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Morgan Brown. So I guess like we could start out pretty high level and talk about your role at Shopify. So what do you do? Uh, what drove you to join Shopify and like maybe the lead up to like how you arrived at this place in your career? Yeah. So uh, I'm the vice president of growth marketing at Shopify, which means I'm responsible for the customer acquisition of our self-serve merchants uh, around the world and the channels that we use to kind of go after and, and accomplish that. And so at a high organizational level for Shopify, um, growth is led by Luke Levesque, who's my boss. And then growth is split into two teams. There's growth marketing, which is my team. And then there's growth product, which is led by Archie Abrams. On growth marketing, that is paid acquisition. So you know, Google search, Facebook, affiliates, kind of all the performance marketing, uh, content marketing, uh, and SEO. Um, lifecycle marketing, email marketing, kind of the, the customer journey. And then what we call growth optimization, but like conversion optimization, experimentation uh, team. So that's kind of on the growth marketing side. And then growth product is really kind of the sign in, sign up, onboarding, trial success, and ultimately retention uh, flows um, to kind of, you know, kind of complete that whole funnel. And then I mentioned we're really focused on what we would call the standard merchant, which is like anyone in the world can go to Shopify.com, start a store, get a 14-day free trial, get up and running. And that's really the, the part of the business that we're focused on. There are other growth teams and marketing teams within Shopify. For example, there's the Shopify Plus team, which is more of a sales-led motion. They, they focus on revenue. So they're really focused on kind of the higher end, bigger brands like the Kylie Jenners and the Red Bulls of the world. Um, and then there are specific teams that are trying to drive product adoption. So, you know, we have the shop app, we have Shopify capital, uh, you know, Shopify retail, point of sale, that type of thing. And so those teams also have marketing and growth teams. But for us, if you think about the big kind of Shopify flywheel, we really own that number of merchants uh, input into, into all of that. So that's, that's what I do. That's kind of the org there. Um, prior to Shopify, I was the head of product. I was a product director at Facebook in the Messenger org. We were building new messaging experiences for families. I was working on an app called Messenger Kids, which is a parent-controlled messaging app that lets people under 13 use it under the auspices and control of their parents' parents account. Um, and within within that role, I led a team of 11 product managers, 80 engineers. Uh, and really trying to build new messaging experiences for this uh, specific use case um, and and really try to drive adoption and, and build the best product uh, possible possible there. Uh, and, uh, and obviously a component of that yeah, is is growth. Um, messaging requires, you know it's a, a network effect based business. and so really focusing on on how to build that user base is critical to the success of the product. And then prior to that, I was the COO of a a company called Inman News, which is um, kind of like a small Bloomberg uh, for real estate. It's a trade publication like uh, Adweek or, or that type of thing. And um, that was a friend's company that I came in and helped as a consultant to start kind of turn around some of their some of their growth. And uh, then ultimately on the back of a bunch of wins, um, you know, led all of product uh, and growth and then ultimately led the uh, entire company as the COO and kind of owned the, the, the profit and loss uh, statement there. 
And then essentially that all built on, you know, 15 years kind of straddling that intersection of digital marketing and product development, which we, which we call growth. So, um, but my background was, you know, it's really kind of a hobbyist and kind of a learn as you go kind of a career path. Like my degree wasn't in marketing. Um, you know, what was your degree in? So, um, my degree, uh, was in biological sciences. Oh, wow. And, and it's funny, like I, um, I actually didn't graduate college my first go around. I really, I just finished my degree just recently. Oh, um, no way. In yeah, the just, same subject? Uh, in the same subject. Yeah. I just kind of kept chipping away at it over. I basically ran out of money uh, in college and so couldn't finish uh, uh, my degree. And so, you know, as time has allowed uh, over the last 20 years, I've kind of chipped away at it and, and finally finished it just to just to make good on, on wrapping it up. But most, all of the marketing stuff is all self, self-learned self um, and kind of, you know, I say my degrees in the school of hard knocks. Um, I'm getting like punched in the face a lot uh, by business, but um, but yeah, so that's that's kind of been the journey. That's the only real way to learn growth, I think. Uh, why yeah. did you choose that major and why did you choose to complete it this many years later? Yeah, um, so... Uh, when I was a kid, I had kind of two passions. One was computers and one was um, marine life, like marine mammals. Um, like I went to SeaWorld. Like, so I grew up on the East Coast in Connecticut. I went to San Diego once when I was like seven and we went to SeaWorld, of course. Uh, and I saw like these huge whales and I was like, these are the coolest things I've ever seen in my entire life. I want to study them. Um, and so I went, I chose the school I went to um, based on uh the best marine biology programs that were available in the country of which one is UC Santa Barbara, where I went. And when I got there uh, to study these like magnificent animals, the first marine biology class you take is the professor says effectively, most of you are here because you've seen like a killer whale or shark or something like that. And you're like very fascinated in learning more about them. And they say, you know, the bad news is those animals make up less than one tenth of 1% of all the biomass in the ocean. So we will be spending about that amount of time studying those animals. 99.9% <laughs> of the biomass in the ocean is plankton. And mm-hmm. so we will be spending most of the time studying plankton. And so then I was like, oh, well, I definitely do not want to just be staring at a microscope at a bunch of like, you know, a handful of cells. Uh, and so just kind of pivoted to biological sciences uh, uh, generally. Um, and then ran out of money also because I made bad decisions in college and like didn't take school seriously for some semesters <laughs> and kind of fell behind, but ultimately did run out of money. Um, but while I was in college, one of the things that I got good at was kind of this, you know, marketing and event promotion, um, figured out a lot of things to, uh, you know, I put on a charity softball tournament um, I threw a bunch of parties. Um, I worked in, you know, bars and nightclubs to kind of like pay, pay my way. And so I learned a lot about that and actually got pretty successful at that. And in fact, won a university award of distinction for the charity softball tournament that we kind of, uh, put on. Um, and so anyway, that was, that was very cool. And so right about this time, 1998, 1999, you know, the internet is kind of, you know, Netscape is just existing. And so kind of my love of computers, I had, you know, kind of tinkered with them as a kid and kind of ripped apart stereo systems and stuff like that growing up and had a Tandy TRS-80 in my bedroom as a kid. And so kind of the advent of the internet, stuff I had found a passion at at school in terms of like marketing um, and kind of the the boom of the internet at that time it was all like oh well this is what i should go go into uh and then like i always felt that like i really wanted to finish what you know i always want to finish what i'm starting and so uh finishing my degree was always something that i wanted to do but it was it was somewhat hard because of some of the residency requirements and and that type of thing to do to finish at uc santa barbara and so um you know, just kind of chipped away at it over time when when time permitted just to say that I finished. I mean, the biggest motivator for me is my dad paid for most of my college and I wanted him to know that I valued that investment and wanted to see it through. So that was that was kind of my main my main motivator. But yeah, so it was it was cool to get that done and you know, send him a copy of the the degree finally. 
That's awesome. Yeah. There's something about closing the loop psychologically that just feels good. Yeah. I love this idea of um, kind of exposure. It's sometimes serendipitous and sometimes innocuous leading you down a winding path that you can't really expect. Like your early experiences with marine life, propelling you to college and studying this, your experiences in college, teaching you that you're essentially like, you've got a skill set in marketing. For me, like I had a friend early on introduced me to guitar and Blink-182. So I always wanted to start a band. Nice. I started a band. It was a small town, so we didn't go very far. But through that experience, I realized that I was not as good at the music side of things, but I was really good at the business building and kind of promotion marketing side, which pushed me into the marketing world as well. So it's, mm-hmm. it's kind of this accidental exposure to that by which I learned um, what my natural inclinations were. So I totally understand that in terms of your context with marketing, but then there's the shift to growth and growth mm-hmm. is slightly different. So yeah. when was your first exposure? When would you say your first uh, growth role was, even if it wasn't called um, you know, growth marketing or growth hacking at the time? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think my first exposure to it was, I want to say like 2000. To 2003, somewhere in there, where uh, so I was working for a digital marketing agency. Um, so my first job out of college, I worked at a startup um, where I was in kind of the operations role I, and like wore every hat, right? Everything from like uh, data analytics to product marketing to uh, content operations, you know, general operations, you name it. Um, but after that startup folded in kind of the dot com meltdown, uh, which is kind of a wild story and. In and of itself. But the next job I had, I went to a digital marketing agency where I was kind of, I was an account executive. I was responsible for, you know, the management of uh, companies' websites and digital marketing presences, which were all very nascent at this time. Like 2003, you're talking to companies that don't even have a website, right? It's kind of like a level set there. Uh, But so it was learning everything from, you know, uh, information architecture, content uh, strategy, although it wasn't called that uh, at that time. Um, building website uh, development tools like content management systems. Uh, this is before WordPress and other CMSs. Um, uh, early email marketing. So kind of this is the advent of Seth Godin's permission, uh, permission-based marketing idea. Um, early SEO and early digital advertising, like buying banner ads uh, using you know Overture, which is the precursor to Google AdWords, and and also early analytics, like using Urchin and uh, which is the precursor to Google Analytics. Um, so one Google AdWords, one Google Analytics. Um, but anyway, in, in kind of doing that, people were starting websites. They didn't really have a strong business justification of why they should be having a website, except that everyone was, ha- was building a website, right? And so kind of the justification of why you would invest in digital marketing was not very clear for any of these companies. You know, it's the very early days. And so um, the whole goal of the agency, obviously, is to like retain and grow the clients. And so you want to be able to deliver really strong results to your business partners in a, in a way that's meaningful and makes sense to them. And so like trying to talk someone into running like banner ads uh, is very hard thing to do. Um, but they all understood, hey, if I was able to grow my email uh, database, that was good. It was kind of you know a, a database of additional potential customers. Growing website traffic made them look good because it could justify the investment in it and that type of thing. And so, some of the things that we started to do at the agency, while we would do all of the traditional like banner ads stuff like that, we were kind of playing around with a lot of SEO stuff. Um, very early days, you know, like white text on white screens and stuff like that. But other things that we're doing more interesting, I think, were like we would build like user forums. Um, so using kind of like bulletin board software, you know, build a user forum to attach to a brand, right? Where there are most, you know, where people could come ask questions, uh, get answers, kind of build the community online around those. Or also building free online tools. So like a mortgage calculator or a cost, you know, how much, you know, of a home could you afford to build or, um, you know, a recipe kind of uh, calculator to kind of change uh, recipe quantities. And what we saw on those, both the communities and the tools, is you see a lot more organic traffic, repeat visits, and frankly, like growth of the things that you care about, you know, those days, which was like website visitors and email uh, databases. And so 
that was my first exposure to this idea that you could build stuff that led to better outcomes in terms of digital marketing and success than just, you know, use kind of the traditional advertising model of I'm going to buy banner ads, I'm going to spend, you know, on pay-per-click. And so for me, it was kind of that, I wouldn't say it was like an aha moment, but it was kind of this like inclination where I was like, oh, there, we can do these things that most people that have MBAs would not consider marketing, right? They would not consider this kind of software development, it's product, it's whatever. Um, but they are real, you know, drivers of, of success in terms of like digital marketing and kind of hitting digital goals and that type of thing. And so I really started to lean into, you know, what are the things we could build, whether it was like a blog or a calculator or a community forum or that type of thing. And so just kind of started to take a slightly different lens into like what it means to grow something uh, online. And then from there, I went to a uh, mortgage company that my friends owned and they're like, Hey, can you come do like lead generation and, and, and kind of like help us you know, drive leads for our business. And so then that's where I really learned like the hardcore performance and optimization stuff, like all the way down to how fast we were able to get someone on the phone from the minute we received the lead and thinking holistically about the that whole funnel and the return on investment for all the spend going into the lead generation. And so kind of marrying this like lightweight product development process from the agency, plus this like real obsession on the funnel metrics and the value that marketing was generating for the business, I think really fused this kind of general notion of, you know, what, what most people call growth now, but those two experiences, I think were kind of what forged it for me. Yeah, there's the two sides of it, kind of the measurement, um, the focus on data with your mortgage company experience, and then the creativity and thinking outside the box, where everything kind of aims towards that North Star of growth and impact. So I could definitely see those two blending together. This is still years before there was a term for this though, right? Yeah. Like timeline yeah, yeah. So this is Yeah, so this is, uh, that is all done by 2007. Yeah. And then the Facebook growth team was kind of our first example of that being... Um, categorized or there was nomenclature around it. So yeah. that was still a couple of years off. Was yeah. there a moment that you heard about this at, at, or from Sean Ellis or yeah. I guess like what was the first time that you heard the term growth or like saw, hey, there's there's a tribe for this. There's a community yeah. of people like me who are thinking in the same way, even if it was nascent at the time. Yeah, for sure. So um, yeah, I remember reading Andrew Chen's blog post, like Growth Hacker is the new VP Marketing. And I kind of read that post and I was, I was like, wow, yes. I was like, this is, these are the words that kind of describe my approach to things that are, you know, are, are kind of like different than kind of, uh, you know, marketing hegemony or, uh, you know, in this area. And so I was like, yeah, I totally identified with that. And then I was working for a digital agency, different one in San Diego um, called Digital Telepathy. Um, and they did like awesome UX and, uh, and I was working on some of their products, but I built a presentation, you know, uh, about growth hacking based on that blog post, based on some of the stuff that we were doing. Cause I was trying to explain to our team, like the things that we were trying to do and um, some of the steps that we had taken uh, to drive product adoption it, through that lens. Um, and I built that presentation. Um, I put it on LinkedIn uh, and then um, you know, I forget how long afterwards I got a LinkedIn message from Sean Ellis, um, who is the guy that him, Keaton Shaw and Patrick Laskovitz all kind of coined this term growth hacker, um, uh, to try to like differentiate what they were doing from kind of traditional marketing as well. And so he's like, I really liked your presentation. It looks like we're both in orange County. Uh, it would be, it'd be great to meet up. And so uh, we went and had lunch, but that was really my kind of like first exposure to it. But it just, it resonated as like, oh yeah, this is, this is what I'm trying to do. That's different than, you know, kind of the more traditional, like 4P based marketing. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it was, it was a really like, kind of going back to your, like the context and the, like, you know, kind of the being in the right place at the right time. Um, the fact that, 
you know, he was in Orange County um, and I was also in Orange County. The fact that I was working at Digital Telepathy, uh, Digital Telepathy had done the design for his website. You know, it was just kind of a, a unique kind of confluence of events that was, you know, just super fortunate for me. Yeah, a lot of serendipity involved. I, yeah. I also, I remember in college reading the Andrew Chen essay. I think that I had found it because I was a Ryan Holiday fan. And he wrote okay. that book called yeah, Growth yeah. Hacker Marketing. Yep. And then I read through that and I was like, I didn't know what I wanted to do at the time. I knew I wanted to get into tech probably through the vehicle of marketing. Mm -hmm. But when I read that, I'm like, this is, this is what I want to do. Like fully impact driven, the experimentation stuff I had never really heard about in the business context. It was all like, yeah. you know, social science statistics classes that I had taken. That's how I knew about T tests. And I was right. like, wait, you can do this in a business context. And then totally. later on, I, you know, lived in the same city as Pep and CXL was probably my big start in terms of like actually learning the skills there. But it's like little things that you pick up along the way that just push you in a certain direction. Totally. Yeah. And I think what's interesting. So I also read Ryan's book, which I, I thought, you know, and, and obviously before growth hacking, there is the whole concept of like guerrilla marketing, right? Mm -hmm. There is the whole concept of viral marketing and, and ways to kind of like break out of like traditional marketing channels to drive awareness and, and adoption. And, and so Ryan's book was a real, it was kind of a, yeah, kind of a validation of like, yeah, these, because I think to some extent, some of the things that I had done, you could classify as guerrilla marketing, but not exactly in kind of the stunt kind of format. They were just like another way to do marketing that was kind of off the beaten, off the beaten path. Um, but uh I was like, oh, okay. So, so Ryan's book is like how to like leverage stunt marketing kind of systematically. You know, he talked a lot about his American apparel work and kind of, you know, his subsequent book, Trust Me, I'm Lying, is like a great example on how to influence media through like PR and stuff like that. But um, so, and then kind of like systematize that and kind of um, turn that into like leverage intentionally. Um, so I think a lot of people think of virality as, you know, a lightning striking, um, which is pr the wrong mental model for it. Um, and Ryan's book is very much like, no, it's not lightning in a bottle. There is kind of a, a method uh, to like, um, you know, there is art and science, but there's certainly a method to like figuring this out. And yeah, so for me, I was like, yeah, this is the type of stuff I'm doing. And then it was just kind of like, there's so much more there though, because uh, I think the piece that was missing and it's been many years since I read his book, but it was more kind of on the stunt side and less on the measurement side and kind of the, like the strong, like causal, like understanding, like the, the, the CRO part, mm -hmm. right. So like kind of marrying those two uh, concepts together is I, I think the, the interesting, uh, it was kind of where I was coming at it from. Yeah. So I think growth, I'm kind of spitballing here, so maybe yeah, this isn't totally. right, but I feel like growth came out of three separate disciplines like that. There was mm -hmm. the viral guerrilla, whatever you want to call it, creative marketing. Yeah. There was the direct response um, and like the heavy focus on measurement and performance, which eventually became, you know, paid acquisition and then growth marketing. And then there's the product development side, but more specifically on like the startup side, because you had yeah. books like... Um, uh, what was the Eric Reese one? The lean, lean startup. startup. Yep. And I feel like that methodology really influenced like how growth professionals and CRO professionals actually built the system. But I yeah. think you're totally right on the the Ryan Holiday focus because I think he did try to emphasize that it was a system, but I mm -hmm. feel like a lot of people pulled away from that the message that, hey, if you get a growth professional, they can just come up with these wacky brainstormed ideas and right. like lightning's gonna strike just based on pure creative brain power. Yeah. Um, and I think that actually probably led to this focus where a lot of people now hear growth hacking and they think, all right, like there's a list of things we can just apply and like skyrocket or skyrocket our growth. And I feel like that's been one of the bigger misunderstandings of the term in the industry, uh, kind of in general. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That term has been uh, abused beyond all recognition at, at this point. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, one of the kind of seminal moments for me, so I met Sean, um, but then it also in 2012, I went to it, I was working at um, Science, which is a startup incubator in LA ran by Mike Jones and kind of ex, ex MySpace guy. So they funded, you know, Dollar Shave Club, um, mo more recently, like Liquid Death uh, with mm. the water. Um, and uh, but one of the guys that came to speak at our offices was this guy named James Courier who uh, was the founder of a social app called Tickle, uh, kind of early web 2.0 uh, 
company uh, that sold for hundreds of millions of dollars. And he now leads um, a venture capital firm called uh, NFX, which stands for Network FX. Uh, and he came and gave a talk about how they were optimizing customer acquisition for Tickle um, through like friend invites and Facebook invites, right? So the Facebook ecosystem was one of the most viral ecosystems when it first launched with newsfeed and friend invites and, and all that type of thing. And he described a situation where their team was just kind of like sitting around in a circle, testing different um, friend invite prompts, seeing which ones drove the most virality and like literally every few minutes testing a new one and then doing the same thing with their ad copy, like posting a Facebook ad, seeing the response rate in like real time and then iterating on those. And so that whole notion of kind of software as leverage, figuring out what really makes a channel work, um, rapid optimization and testing where they're doing it almost in real time was just kind of another part of the puzzle that, uh, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, there's a ton, like this makes a ton of sense why, you know, the traditional speed of marketing coming from my agency background was you have a planning cycle for a quarter, you then go execute on that cycle for a quarter, you come back at the end of the quarter, you you produce results and say what learned, what worked and what didn't, and you propose new things to try. And I was like, oh, these guys are literally changing things by the minute. And the companies that I had been helping were, were changing things by the quarter and I was like, oh, like there's there's just so much leverage and upside uh, to this operating model. And so that was kind of another piece of the puzzle that really uh, resonated for me then. Yeah. So do you think it was the speed itself, the impact focus, or I could also maybe draw the line to your early experience and like kind of curiosity from a scientific point of view, because I do feel like growth people are also very like curious, like they'll ask the five whys and they'll go down to that core of like first principle and yeah. second guess the sacred cows. Do you think those things attracted you to growth or like, what would you attribute that personally in terms of yeah. your inclination in this direction? Yeah, hundred percent. I think the hypothesis led kind of experiment driven definitely resonated with my science background. Um, the, you know, leveraging software and kind of being able to like tinker with things online, definitely kind of tied back into the stuff that I played around with as a, as a kid. Um, yeah. And then I, I'm a highly competitive person. Uh, so just the ability to see results, uh, you know, I like playing games that have a scoreboard, mm -hmm. um, and like being able to like make a change and then see its impact, whether it worked or didn't like is a dopamine hit. Right. So, um, yeah, I think all those things, uh, really, really drew me to it. Um, and also the fact that like no one else was really doing this stuff, it, it felt cutting edge, you know, it, I, I don't want to discount that, that it just felt exciting um, because it was so kind of novel uh, in a way too. So um, yeah. That kind of breeds a tighter community too. I found the yeah. same thing in conversion rate optimization and especially working at CXL because we threw the conferences, but you would see the same people over and over and it would get bigger cumulatively over time. But because it was kind of like a, a small group, you had this us versus the world mentality and you were just trying to, it was like you had a big group that was all trying to evangelize this thing together. And I would imagine the early growth days felt a lot like that as well. Now it's yeah. of course much more mature, it feels like. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. And then, you know, you kind of asked about like the the personality type and the the five whys. One of the interesting things that we do at Shopify is everyone takes the uh, Enneagram personality test uh, where we kind of figure out like what type you are. Can um, I guess what yours is? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Three. Ooh, it's a good guess. Um, and I actually was a three earlier in my career. So I took the test back in like 20... 13 2012 and i was a three but my most i when i most recently took it i was a five and what's the five the five is the inquisitor is the um the 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 one that like questions deeply um so it's not the uh it's not kind of the uh devil's advocate um that's you know more of the seven um but the five is just the very inquisitive kind of cerebral uh type where yeah, you just want to know things deeply. Um, you want to ask the five whys. You always want to understand how things work. Um, you kind of like in constant like research and learn uh, mode. So yeah, I think um, I'm a five and then I flex to a seven sometimes, which is the, challenger. Really to be like the challenger. Um, 
Uh, and, but yeah, and I, I still think I have a little three left in me, probably depending on how I answer the questions. But it's interesting because Shopify does that for everyone. And then everyone on their internal work profiles has their type listed. So like Toby Luke, he's like a seven. Luke Levesque, who's my boss, he's a three. R.T. Abrams is my kind of uh, peer in our group. He's a three. But it's really helpful. You can see everyone's type. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you're kind of in meetings or it, like working with them, it's, it's helpful to know. But yeah, I, th I definitely think the type five, type three people are attracted to, uh, type seven people are attracted to the growth problem space, uh, maybe more than others. It, yeah, it makes a ton of sense. I love these things too. We, we talk about it internally at our agency, uh, at least. So I have the three. And I'm a tie with the adventurer or the, the spontaneous one. So I've kind of got this push and pull between those two sides. Nice. I remember scoring quite highly on the five as well, which is the investigator inquisitive kind of persona. Yeah. That's, I feel like that's archetypically like the, uh, like a Malcolm Gladwell who walks mm -hmm. down the grocery aisle and wonders, I wonder why there's a million brands of mustard, but only one brand of ketchup. And then has right. to like go down this research rabbit hole and like answer that question before he's satisfied. Yeah, totally. Totally. My kids give me a hard time about that all the time. Like we'll be, we were in Disney world a few years ago. Um, and they're like, you know, nine, 10 years old and it started raining. And I'm like, how many ponchos do you think Disney world's going to sell today? <laughs> you know? And so we just like extemporaneously, like walk around kind of like trying to opportunity size the number of poncho sales in a, a given rainy day at Disney world. So yeah, I definitely can, can map to that. Do you have a, uh, do you have sleep problems? Um, I, I don't have sleep problems probably cause I have a toddler, uh, also. Uh, and so he, he takes care of my, uh, sleep problems uh, for me. Gotcha. Yeah. It's a random question, but I ask because I've got the same thing where I'll, I'll like just ponder these ideas and I feel like they keep me up. Like yeah. I, I can't, I can't rest until I figure this thing out. And I feel like those things just loop through the brain sometimes. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. I certainly think like having to get things out of, out of my head helps, uh, you know, write them down or, or whatever, but, uh, but yeah, you can, yeah, your brain can get stuck on for sure. So I'm definitely going to ask you a bunch of questions about writing a book. That's something cool. that's interesting to me. Yeah, and then it. I want to ask about the Inman stuff, but first I want to just first clear up the, the etymology, like the nomenclature here. Um, and I feel like Part of me doesn't want to do this because it's it's so common to do in like CRO and growth. Mm -hmm. But do you think so? We we name things, I think, to give us a sense of clarity, to attract like-minded people, to set a sense of distinguishment from other things that you could be doing. So I can see the value of creating a term like growth or growth hacking or growth marketing, CRO, or in the case of HubSpot, inbound marketing. But yeah. do you think that there's a point at which these things become less helpful through the dilution of the term? Like, where do you see the term growth now in terms of like being a utility to help people understand and kind of form their structure of their work? Oh yeah. Now it's a disaster. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's been so uh, kind of, you know, appropriated and kind of attached to everything. I think I, even saw someone with a title called like growth PR. And oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't know what that meant. Um, and, and basically growth has been stuck on everything. Um, you know, like uh, the growth has basically come become synonymous with performance, which I think uh, is problematic um, is, but the genie is kind of out of the bottle. I think, uh, you know, everyone, like the, the thing about growth hacker, the term, is that everyone in marketing hated it. And everyone who didn't associate with kind of the tradition, like more people like me who didn't have the traditional marketing background, you know, MBA pedigree was like, oh yes, this is kind of, you know, and all the, this is the, this is the difference. You know, this is something that I can identify with. And so because no one was ambivalent about it, it got real, it got sucked into the zeitgeist of business, right? Um, it's like a core business need. A bunch of people hated it and a bunch of people loved it. Um, I think, you know, Sean used to say, if people were ambivalent about the term, we wouldn't be talking about it anymore because mm -hmm. it just wouldn't matter. Um, but yeah, but it's become so, and then obviously businesses value growth, right? They value, like they, businesses played with a scoreboard. And so I think a lot of companies, you know, growth was born during the time of like, if you build it, they will come kind of a, a skepticism from the startup ecosystem to the value of marketing, uh, mm -hmm. frankly. 
And so it kind of like slotted into this uh, zeitgeist in a way. And then I think a bunch of people realize the potential value for themselves or kind of the, you know, if you add the word growth to anything, um, it would get more business priority, you know, maybe more visibility for the projects they're working on and so on and so forth. So then you end up with growth hacking, product like growth, growth marketing, um, growth PR, uh, you know, all everything performance marketing is renamed growth marketing, conversion rate optimization gets lumped in with growth. Like, so yeah, it kind of just kind of snowballed. And now I think it's, you know, so messy, um, that there isn't really a lot of value. Uh, like if you see someone with their, with growth in their title, you cannot make any assumptions about what they do or what they're good at or anything like that at, at all. And so versus something like email marketing is, is very clear or, you know, um, out of home uh, is very clear. So yeah, it's, it's become a term of, uh, yeah, it's just, there's no differentiation in it at all anymore. It seems like this broadening of it could be useful in some ways if we just drop the fact that it's delineated from other, or like it's a separate thing. And by that, I mean, CRO, there's been this argument for like the last six years, it's, it just keeps cropping up where it's like, hey, we should rename this term because it doesn't really explain what we do. And then there's this uphill battle where everybody who has been around long enough is like, yeah, we've tried that. Let's just let it go. This is we've we've fought hard enough to get people to understand this in the first place. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's useful just as like a mindset shift, right? Like maybe people can apply CRO mindset to like different areas and there doesn't have to be like a specific field or role for CRO. Maybe it's like a operating system. And I feel like if you apply the growth lens to PR, to brand awareness, to product marketing, to other areas where it's not traditionally done. Maybe that could still be useful. But then the flip side, my devil's advocate argument, which I probably believe more, is that it's difficult for both employers and employees. So I remember joining HubSpot, and I'm not resentful for this because it was a cool time, but I apply, or I got pulled in for a growth marketing role. And in my mind, growth was a blending of product and marketing, and it was experiment-driven. And it was like this pretty crystal clear thing because I had read mm -hmm. Hack and Growth and I had read you know all the blog posts and books. And then it turned out it was just fully acquisition-focused and it was kind of this creative, let's find new channels. And I was like, I, that's kind of cool, but it's not really what I was expecting. Yeah. And then internally, there was also growth marketers who did email, who did messaging. There was a product growth team. And eventually I'm like, what, what the hell is growth? And like, how mm -hmm. do, is, is this useful if I'm applying for jobs at this point? Yeah. And then you have like D 2 C companies who use growth as like, like you said, performance marketing, which is totally separate from like the product thing. So yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I think if growth is taken as a mental model, um, it can be helpful. I think slapped on as a label, it's not helpful. So I, I would kind of agree with you that like, yeah, any team, any function can come at problem solving at a first principles level from kind of the growth perspective, which, you know, could be argued as just like good business perspective, but um, uh, that's, that's where I think it's helpful. It's like, okay, understand the core inputs to your system, understand the biggest levers that you have within those inputs to influence the outcomes that you want constant ownership, you know, and execution against those inputs because you know that they drive your business. I think the, the thing that happened was that marketing didn't have ownership of the end outcomes. So they only focused on the things that they could influence, which were like top of the funnel stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then product was really just focused on building product, building the vision that they have for it. And so it left you this chasm in the middle of like, who actually owns the outcomes of the business? And the answer was really no one. And so I think that's why you see all growth teams kind of flourish. Now that thinking is, is pretty widely accepted or is becoming more and more accepted. And so I think, you know, whether you actually need a growth team or not anymore uh, is really dependent on, you know, the stage, the companies in the game you're playing uh, and that type of thing. And I think growth teams overall have had a pretty spotty track record uh, to date in terms of their success and longevity. So yeah, I think ultimately it does, it is kind of that mental model of like who owns the things that matter the most in your business. Um, and is there like clear ownership and resourcing against that? And if the answer is no, you probably have a problem. Um, 
And if the answer is yes, then it's not clear that like an additional team focused on it is going to be incrementally beneficial. But yeah, so I think there's, yeah, it kind of um, has exploded to a point uh, where I think it will start to normalize back the back the other way. Is is the inevitable endpoint or like goal of a growth program then, at least at the scale of a Shopify or a HubSpot, is it sort of homogenizing and centralizing and enabling other teams? Like the, um, what's it called? The center of excellence model, where like you can pick the KPIs, you can help educate teams on like the proper process and, you know, experimentation protocol and measurement and whatever things you would own that would help all these other teams out. Because it feels like there still is a key value add that you can carve out by having somebody who owns those things that can work with the email team that can work with the yeah. data acquisition team. And just so not like everybody's not running in different directions, right? It's kind of like a vector alignment function. Yeah. Would you totally. say that's probably the pinnacle of, of value that a growth team can offer at, at least that scale or? Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on the, the organization. So like at Facebook, and I'll talk about Shopify in a second, but uh, at Facebook, there's kind of like three three main growth teams, maybe four, depending on how you count it. But like there's core growth. The core growth team was really just responsible for Facebook's monthly active users and daily active users and the levers that drove that. So if you think about like Facebook's business model, highly reliant on the number of monthly active people that use it and daily active people that use it. And any given product team is not really going to be worried about that top line metric because they're so focused on their own product, right? Like marketplace, like Facebook marketplace team is not going to be worried about the overall daily active users for Facebook, right? And that same is true for any product team. So you have a, a growth team that's like focused on those core inputs uh, and core me metrics for the overall business health. And they just own them every day, all day, around the clock. Um, and so that's, that's their focus. That's kind of the core growth team. Then every product team use some of their engineering resources and product resources to drive growth. So those product teams have growth teams, which are really focused on product adoption, retention, and success. So like Marketplace has a, has a growth team, and they're really focused on the number of people that discover Marketplace, find value in it, and then use it. And that growth team is probably, and I didn't work on Marketplace, I worked in Messenger, but that growth team, if I had to guess it, Marketplace was split between uh, supply growth and demand growth. And so on the supply side, they're worried about making sure there's enough sellers and enough like relevant inventory for people looking for it. And then on the uh, you know uh, demand side, they're really focused about product adoption and finding people with shopping intent to kind of discover the product. So they've got a growth team there. And then the third type of growth team that, we, that Facebook had, it was called product growth, which is that center of excellence model where they're really like analysts, uh, but are schooled in the best practices of product adoption that then go and work with these individual product teams like Marketplace will have a couple of product growth people embedded. And those product growth people will be inputs into the product, the growth team's roadmap in terms of like, hey, this is the biggest opportunity. These are the insights we have about the funnel. Here's how you can drive participation rate. Here's how you can drive retention rate, so on and so forth that kind of like influence that and kind of that product growth team acts as a, like a network effect of sharing wins back and forth all across the, the company. So I think like the, like thinking of it, like the mental model of like those three different layers of growth is, is helpful based on the stage that you're at. Obviously not everyone's a 50,000 person company, so you got to kind of calibrate appropriately. But yeah, I think in Shopify it's similar where it's like, we're like the core growth analog to Facebook. Like we're focused on the number of merchants using Shopify every month right? Like active merchants. That's, we want to bring Shopify to the world. Shopify's flywheel is driven by the number of people using it. We're just, we own those top line active merchant numbers all the time. Um, then we do have a layer of, um, you know, like we do have experimentation best practice team. So, you know, like Chanel uh, and Cassandra, they're kind of, on, they're that center of excellence type of team. And then we do have like the tooling and infrastructure Layers. Is that, which, wait, is that on your org, the experimentation, or is that a separate it's, team? It's in Luke's org. So it's in the growth org, but it's not in my team. Gotcha. Gotcha. So yeah, slightly so adjacent, but same. slightly adjacent, but same mm -hmm. overall, like uh, top level uh, org structure. Um, and then we do have the tooling and all of that that kind of empowers like growth teams kind of across the, across the company. So 
Yeah, that feels ideal ideal to me. How, how did it work at Inman? Yeah, so at Inman, much smaller company. So you're talking like 50, 30, 30 to 50 people. Um, and at Inman, there really was a very small engineering team and then there, uh, and then a marketing team, which was mostly focused on events. And then you had the editorial team, which created all the content. Mm-hmm. But you Wait, really so the, did, the business yeah. model itself, it was a content site, but what was the yep. the was it subscription or what was the go to market and all that yeah. stuff? Yeah, totally. So uh, Inman is um, a B2B trade publication. So it was a uh, media site focused on the practitioners in real estate. So primarily real estate agents, real estate brokers, technology companies that sell to them, and kind of the services ecosystem that supports real estate generally. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the the audience. Uh, Inman had been around uh, since like 1991 as an offline column moved online in the, the late 90s. And its its business model was it had two streams of revenue. One was digital advertising, which was very small. And its big revenue line was events. So they basically held two events every year. And those events drove uh, the majority of the revenue. And then the company actually operated at a loss for every other month, um, kind of off of the proceeds of those events. So that was kind of the 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 business that I walked into, um, you know, like revenue on it was like a million and a half a year. It was losing money. It was it was in pretty bad shape. Um, and so, looking at it, yeah, it was kind of like, hey, how do we how do we improve the two existing streams of revenue, um, advertising and events, and then how do we introduce new uh, streams of of revenue? And so. Um, yeah, we can like dive into those, but the the big innovation was launching a subscription uh, s- subscription for Inman um, and putting almost everything behind uh, a paywall. Um, and essentially, by the time I left that business, it was on a ten million a year annual run rate, um, and has continued to grow. It was recently, actually, just this month, uh, was acquired by a private equity oh, wow. firm. Ultimately, so. Um, so yeah, so I think like some of those things you put in place really worked. But yeah, it was kind of understanding what was working and what wasn't working, and then like what the like the big exponential investment could be, and and that turned out to be the subscription. But, but yeah, so that was that business uh, in a very high level nutshell. Did y'all work with the content and editorial side directly, or was that kind of operating on its own autonomous level? Like, was it, I guess, like I could see SEO playing into this mm-hmm. and distribution and actually yep. maximizing the overall, I guess, ceiling of people you're bringing in. Was that yep. under your function or was it more so just monetizing and finding net new revenue channels with the content that was already going out? Yeah. So Inman has always had, has been very clear in kind of their journalistic divide uh, from the business side and and very clear like first principles around that. And so, yeah, on the editorial side, um, it really was about feeding back to the editors, the editor in chief, the analytics we were seeing about the the articles um, and what was working and what wasn't working. So two specific examples. They used to, so a small editorial team, like six, seven people, right? It's a small company. Um, and they're trying to cover the entire real estate industry. And they were, they had two story formats. They had a, a wire or a brief, which is essentially like a one paragraph capture of like some breaking news. Like it's basically mm-hmm. like a press release that someone issued and they rewrite it into like 200 words and publish it to give you kind of like, like a, a Reuters kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Um, so very high level. Uh, and then they had the more in depth pieces, um, which is like net new that you couldn't find uh, anywhere else. And what we looked at was the the editorial team was writing each like two to three of these wires a day, but then only publishing like one longish piece per week. But the the wires were like useless. Like they're getting like 200 page views a pop. Like, so we're like, how much time are you guys putting into the writing these wires? And it turns out to be a significant amount of time because they have to kind of like mine through the news of the day, pick the one they want to write, rewrite it you know, whatever, publish it. And so we're like, hey, if we got rid of this type of content, could you do more of this other type of content, which was more media? And the the writers were like, yes, we hate the wires because we're just regurgitating press releases. They don't add any value, but we're just doing it because we have to. 
And so we just made the pitch like, hey, you don't have to do these. We'll get more traffic and more readers if we do more of the the net new kind of uh, exclusive stuff. And so they were thrilled. Uh, so we, we ran an experiment. We're like, okay, for two weeks, we're not going to publish any wires, but just invest more in the long form content. And so we saw the number of long form content go up. We saw our traffic go up. No one complained about the wires missing because they're super low value and no one's reading them anyway. And then we decided to kill that feature and, and kind of uh, go, go that route. So that's like one example of working with editorial. The other time we helped editorial was um, like uh, no writer likes quotas. Like if you ask a journalist to like stick to a quota, it's like you know very antithetical to their uh, their practice. Um, some companies have quotas for sure, but like for the most part, most uh, journalists don't like quotas. Uh, and so the publisher Brad was like, "Hey, should we give these these folks a quota?" And um, we're kind of going back and forth. And and what I pulled some data analysis over like a six month trend where. Um, they were asked to write, we had like a soft quota, like try to file like two stories a week or whatever. Um, but what had happened was the business had kind of slid from most journalists publishing two stories a week to most journalists publishing like one and a half stories a week or like one and a third stories a week. But it had been kind of imperceptible, that slide, but it it became very clear that the number of total stories that were net new had like declined by like 30%. And so rather than putting in a quota, we just sat down with all the writers and I was like, look, you used to be producing like almost two stories a week. Now you're producing like one and a third stories per week. And that's actually cutting your annual contribution to the business by X number of stories. And we're just like, it would be great if we can like reverse that trend. So we didn't put in a quota, but we use analytics to help them understand um, their their output and its contribution to uh, to our overall traffic, and then we did simple stuff like we put like chart beat up in the up in the office on like a big screen, so the writers could all see the like real time stats, and people would get excited when an article popped or you know a breaking news alert went out, and, and people tend started to get excited about the performance of what they were doing because it meant more exposure for for them and their ideas, and so those are a few ways that we influence the editorial side, but we didn't like, you know, kind of like commandeer it at all. And we also did like SEO workshops. We worked on SEO. Mm -hmm. We fixed a lot of like SEO is very broken on Inman. We did a ton of cleanup uh, work um, there that, that had a lot of it. Um, and there were some other things that we pulled outside of the editorial funnel that, that helped drive growth as well. Yeah. The, it's an interesting relationship, the growth and SEO and content relationship. We do this series called Kitchen Side, where the co-founders of the agency and all and I talk about like subjects and we'll just kind of mm -hmm. brainstorm and debate. And uh, we had one on how growth fits in with content. And um, one of the ways that we found was pretty typical was this distribution focus. So helping the content team and the edit editorial team actually reach the right people, um, typically through SEO, since it tends to be pretty quant driven and pretty it, like you can build an SEO growth model in the same way that you can build a company growth model. Um, the other way is that, like you said, it was kind of like how a management consultant would approach it. It's like you went in and audited kind of the efficiency and chose strategic experiments to see if you could basically, uh, you know, reduce the uh, resource cost and maintain the uh, kind of output or results. But there are interesting ways that these two work together. Is that so? You said that um, the content team is on the growth team at Shopify, or it's yeah. on your org? Yeah. Yep. Are there yeah. things you've pulled from those Inman lessons that you've pulled to um, your Shopify content operations or any lessons learned there? Yeah, totally. So, the, I mean, the, the Shopify content team operates at a much larger scale than uh, Inman ever did. Um, yeah, but I mean, we have a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of great people creating content for uh, Shopify. Content's very broad, right? Like uh, mm. there is the blog, um, but we also have like the master's podcast. We have the learn with Shopify YouTube channel. We have, um, you know, there's all of the free tools that Shopify has like burst and hatchful and like all of that. There is, um, the, all the education center. So there's like the Shopify encyclopedia and there's like the, like the learn, uh, the whole directory. So it's just all like video driven, um, like tutorial content. So there's a lot when we say content at Shopify, but yeah, I think, um, some of the things 
that uh, that work well or that, that are lessons. Um, one is like having teams that are focused on um, like the the conversion of the traffic from from content, you know, kind of like from the audience development side and the content side into like the business outcome side. So we have a team called Channel Acceleration. And they're really focused on taking the, the largest surfaces of our customer acquisition apparatus and helping to experiment on those and identify opportunities to like improve, uh, you know, business outcomes. So for example, the editorial team in Shopify, figuring out the right articles to write, they partner with SEO to identify, you know, net new areas to go into, you know, uh, cross-linking opportunities um, you know, keywords we want to go after, so on and so forth. But then they also have like a pure editorial kind of remake because Shopify wants to be the entrepreneurship company. You know, we want to be the known source of like what's the, the center of the e-commerce and, and ultimately commerce universe. So there's kind of multiple business objectives we have there. Um, but yeah, so they work with the SEO team on kind of what's the, what are the areas to expand our SEO moat and kind of, you know, continue to, to build that, that coverage. Um, then there's the pure editorial like brand perspective to be that center of the universe. And then there is kind of the performance of that content uh, relative to like contribution to the number of merchants that are using Shopify. And so you have different teams um, with different uh you know, kind of objectives that work in a cross-functional nature across the surface to, to drive those things. So um, yeah, that's kind of the mental model. But yeah, I, th I think in terms of um, things that, that I learned from Inman is like, hey, uh, most of the pages that people are experiencing are just the article pages themselves. So like understand those deeply. What are the tools that we have to convert that traffic and shape that traffic? Um, like not everyone's ready to start a free trial, but like how do we shape and move that traffic around in a really intentional way? So that piece, uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt, yeah. that piece you said there's a team that does that, like cha channel expansion? Yeah, channel acceleration. Acceleration. Yeah. Is yeah. that separate from the CRO team and the other experimentation efforts? Yes. Yeah. So um, if you kind of take uh, the experimentation team as like a center of excellence that helps any team in Shopify run trustworthy experiments, that's their mission, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, understand the experimentation platform, understand what it means to run a successful experiment, understand whether it makes sense for an experiment to run or not. And they serve every team, whether it's a product marketing team, brand team, product team, they kind of like the clearing house for advice on how to run trustworthy experiments. Um, and and uh, help teams identify which those are. So if like if a team comes to Chanel or Cassandra and they're like, hey, we want to run an experiment where we change this footer link on this page to maybe this other footer link, is that a good experiment to run? They'll be like, no, you're not gonna get enough traffic. You're not gonna get a large enough sample, like do something different. Mm -hmm. Or if they're like, hey, I wanna run this experiment that ties like a landing page plus an email journey together. How do I keep the audiences my test and control separate as they move across these different systems, like they're going to be the ones to kind of help with, with that. So really like a center of excellence around experimentation. Mm -hmm. Channel acceleration has a goal of using experimentation and rapid iteration to drive uh, active merchant outcomes, right? So the conversion rate is X, how do we move it to Y? And they use experimentation as a input to that but their function is this active merchant contribution, which is different than the experimentation team, which is like, how do I run trustworthy experiments? Does that make yeah, sense? no, I love that. That makes a ton of sense to me. Um, I don't know where I was going to go with that. I think I interrupted. You were, you were talking no, no. about the rest of your lessons. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think like, yeah, understanding how traffic uh, gets shaped around the, the site is like a, a big thing that we're leaning into. And, and then just the, you know, we have a lot of great people on the team, like Kevin Indig and the whole SEO team, plus, uh, you know, our whole content marketing team working together to identify those opportunities. So, yeah, I think those, the things that I did at Inman weren't necessarily uh, novel. They were just the best practices. And so how do we do more of, you know, how do we just kind of keep refining how we're doing that at Shopify uh, to get better and better is kind of the, the focus. Um, 
there. Yeah, the focus on swim lanes, I love people um, being enabled and autonomous to do their best work with their strengths in mind and all of that kind of working cohesively. The struggle, of course, is scaling, but it sounds like in terms of org structure, y'all have put a lot of thought into that at this point. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, you, you, it's interesting you said swim lanes because we actually at Shopify don't like the term swim lanes because we feel swim lanes leads to silos. Uh, so mm-hmm. we think of it more as water polo where everyone has a role to play but you play all over the field, right? Or, or more like a jazz band. Um, you're playing the same game. You're playing the same yeah. song. Yeah, yeah, you're playing the same game, playing the same song, but you have the autonomy and uh, opportunity to be creative and kind of apply that and to kind of create something that new. And so I think like Toby Lukey uses uh, like the jazz band analogy a lot, which I, which I really like. But yeah, I mean, sc- scaling is hard. Uh, and so like previously, um, Shopify was organized into like single functional uh, teams, right? Like the content team just did content stuff, but they weren't really uh, integrated with the SEO team. The SEO team operated over here, the content team operated over here. And, you know, one of the things we've done over the last year is to get them into like a true cross functional operating model where we have a business goal, like organic growth, with people from content people from SEO, people from engineering, people from data science, people from user research, people from operations cross-functionally in this, we call them missions against this business objective, which bring all of these collective strengths together. And I think that's, you know, that's kind of one of the big changes that we made in terms of how we do growth at Shopify over the last year is to kind of get all those superpowers, you know, pulling in the same direction. Yeah, it seems like org structure is part of that, but the truly challenging piece would probably be the KPI setting and aligning people around that same goal. And yeah. then how do you choose that and make it less gameable and less uh, controversial in terms of like, you know, this team feels like they're being being short-ended by this goal. Like it seems yeah. like a lot of the pressure is really in setting that goal and having all teams agree on that. Yeah, it's super yeah, it's super important and I think um yeah, having that North Star for like what the team is trying to achieve. Like I mentioned, we're kind of focused on the active merchants of Shopify. Like everything rolls up into that. And then you have operational metrics, which help people do their jobs. Uh, but the operational metrics kind of ladder up into this uh, this overall North Star. And then you try to standardize the way people think about the potential opportunities that they have to go leverage kind of across the across the ecosystem towards that end goal so that everyone's kind of talking the same language in terms of like their contribution to the business or how they think about prioritizing their work and i think that's actually the hardest uh piece of the puzzle because um you know some pieces some areas are by definition easier to measure than other areas um and so kind of harmonizing all that is is the the hard work i think uh, why did you write a book? I wrote a book um, because I thought back to how I learned everything. And I was it was all like serendipitous and uh, happenstance and took a lot of digging and scrapping and, and placing stuff together. And I was like, it would be great if going forward, people could pick up like a reference to it and and just get a good jumping off point to everything that the space kind of covered and, and, and basically document everything up until that point in time of like how the thinking had evolved. And so that was one big input. Uh, the second big input um, is I always had a desire to, uh, I wanted to leave something behind when I was gone that kind of outlasted me, right? Mm-hmm. Like, how do you like, uh, capture something of yourself that, um, yeah, has more staying power than like a human life. And I was like, you know, a a book is actually a pretty good store of information and perspective that, you know, has a much longer time horizon than, uh, than an individual human life. And so I was like, Oh, I would like to have something like that. Um, that I can say, like I contributed beyond just the the years I put on the planet. Um, so that was a, a big kind of like intrinsic uh, motivator. Um, so those were probably, probably the two big ones, um, personally. Uh, and then was, was that a general drive or was that, um, did you specifically want to write a book from an earlier age? 
it was more of a general general drive um but i read a ton like mm-hmm. i'm reading constantly uh i have a really like my addiction is buying books um and uh so um i just i place a lot of uh inherent value in them and so like aspiring to be able to kind of contribute to that that uh community was like a a a big piece of it and then kind of thinking about of the things i could leave behind you know a book seemed to be something valuable. I mean, it could have been a piece of software. It could have been a company. It could have been any of these other things. Um, I, I think I still aspire to work with generational companies and um, help them kind of achieve those those things. So it shows up in more than just the book, but it was definitely a motivator for the book. And you had done a, a lot of writing in the past before that. I remember you ran yeah. a daily newsletter um, for growth growth tips. And yeah, in totally, general, yeah. I feel like you, yeah. you've written quite a bit. Yeah, totally. I think, um, you know, back when I was at the mortgage company, uh, it was the explosion of like Web 2.0. We realized that like blogs were a way to get free traffic, but you have to write a lot. So I ended up actually like running, building a blog, running it, uh, ran it as an editorial uh, product had many freelance writers ultimately ended up selling it. Uh, it still exists out there today. It's been sold and resold a bunch of times. Um, so yeah, so writing, uh, coming from the marketing side of things with like content st- strategy, writing website, copy, writing email, copy, like all of that. So yeah, I think writing has been just, um, something that is, uh, like my preferred way of communication. Um, and so, yeah, so that definitely, I had a muscle for, for doing that. Um, that made it seem like a good out, outlet for me. What was the process like? Was there any piece of the process that surprised you? Uh, yeah, lots of it. So I learned so much um, along the way, mostly like what not to do. Um, so most people, so I'll give you like the, the mistakes that I made. Um, I started with the general idea that like writing a book means you write a book and then you find someone to publish it and sell it. Um, and so I kind of started with that mental model of, I need to write this book first, and then I will figure out how to go get it kind of published. And so I invested a ton of time uh, in writing a book. Um, I wrote 100,000 words. I still have it in Google Docs somewhere of an initial book called like The Physics of Growth. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, I wrote it all. And I was like, cool, like, how do we get this thing out there? And um, I got connected to my agent, uh, this woman, she's incredibly talented, Lisa Demona. Um, she is uh, like Seth Godin's agent, Reed Hoffman's agent. She's like amazing. And uh, I was like, I have this book. I want to get published. She's like, no, no, no. You start with the proposal. So like, the only thing that matters is your proposal. She's like, put, put down the book and start from scratch on the proposal. And so... I took this 100,000 like multi-year effort and put it aside. And then we just started on the business proposal. And the business proposal really tries to answer a few key questions. It's like, why this book? Why now? And why you? Right? And that's, that's really it. It's like, why does this book need to exist? Why is the right time for this book to come into existence now? Like, why hasn't it come in in the past? And why isn't it like... Why is it the opportunity right to write it right now? And then, you know, probably most importantly is like, why are you the person to write this book? Out of all the people that could write this book, why are, why are you? And so we then put in another eight months just on the proposal. So a proposal is like a 60-page document. It includes answers to all of those questions. It's like what the book's about, who the audience is like why you're the one to write it and like, what are the proof points that like, you're the right person to write this. Cause obviously it's a business investment by the companies. They want to know that there's like a built in audience and all of that stuff. A sample of the book structure, a sample chapter attached to it. So what's like the best chapter you could write and attach to, to the proposal. And so we worked for like eight months on that. And then uh, um, we, we worked with a, book proposal writing specialist um, who has worked with. So Lisa referred us to her. And so Sean and I and her just like revved through this thing a ton. And then once we got it to Lisa and she's like, okay, this looks good. Then she was able to go and take it and, uh, and pitch it. Um, And uh, 
yeah. So step one is like, don't write the book, <laughs> write the proposal. That's kind of step one. Um, that's the big learning there. The second big learning was the value of the author is not necessarily to write the book, but to protect the core ideas of the book as you go through the writing process. Because like in our book, we have me, Sean, we have the woman that helped us with the proposal, also helped us as an editor. Then we had Crown Business, um, which is a division of Penguin Random House. So we had our editor there. We had um, a couple of copy editors. We had our agent. We had the executives at Crown Business who had like a vision for the book. But like Sean and I are ultimately the only ones that truly know the idea very clearly. And so a lot in the editing process, you get a lot of good feedback on like, hey, this doesn't flow very well. Is there a story you could plug in? Is there an example you could plug in? But sometimes they'd be like, they'd take an idea and be like, the way you said this idea, it sounds better like this. And you're like, oh, well, that actually like destroys the value of the idea when you say it that way. So we have to like undo that and try to rewrite it in a more like friendly way. So I think kind of the just knowing that it's like a team sport. Uh, and so the author has to hold the thread um, all the way through. Um, and then I think the, the third big lesson was, um, yeah, whatever book size you see on the shelf, about three to four times that amount of writing has like gone into it because so much ends up on the cutting room floor. Um, mm -hmm. Because you're really trying to, it's almost like a movie, right? You're trying to look like shot by shot, the best way to tell the story. And so you have multiple shots that you can consider. And um, so, yeah, so those are like the three big takeaways that I got. But the the first one, start with the proposal, not the book, is like the number one piece of advice I'd give to anyone writing a book. It's, fun. it's funny and mildly ironic because it's like you coded up the experiment before writing the experiment document, or yeah. you, you wrote the blog post before designing like a content brief, right? Yeah. It's yeah, like totally. you exactly. had to do that smoke test first to make sure people actually wanted it. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Totally right. Yeah. I just went straight to the, you know, shipping stage, which is the uh definitely the wrong order of operations. <laughs> the second piece is interesting too. Um are you a, a Nassim Taleb fan? Yeah, totally. He talks a lot about this with his editors and how um what word would you say? Stubborn, idiosyncratic he is in terms of like what he pushes through. Mm -hmm. He's very ruthless in terms of like edits for the core content content and like his language. And he has, I think, full chapters, I think in Anti-Fragile or Skin in the Game, where he talks about like his process of working with editors and how frustrating it is when they come and try to change his ideas. So kind of interesting. Yeah, totally. And I think I have read that. Um, and Anti-Fragile is one of my favorite, favorite books. Um, but uh I actually found our editors to be super value add because they took a lot of technical jargony kind of inside concepts that were very intuitive to like a me and a Sean. But when you tried to exploit it out to like a business audience, they didn't really land well. And so like, Hey, you're kind of like 10 steps down the road. You need to come back and explain this, this piece of it, or this is too theoretical. You need to give like a tangible example. So like, our editors were champs. Um, I actually really loved working with, with all of them, but the, um, and they made the book infinitely better. Cause I actually talking about your AB test, I actually can compare hacking growth to the original manuscript of the physics of growth, which oh, it kind yeah. of sits in its untouched form. And like hacking growth is like orders of magnitude better, which I attribute to all the inputs of people other than me. Cause I'm the only common denominator on the, the first version. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so they were great, but it was just kind of like maintaining that like point of view on like, there was, you could find drift in the edits that you really had to like, oh, this is kind of a tertiary point. That's not the main thing. This isn't actually what we're trying to say. So yeah, just having that kind of uh, hand on the rudder is like really important. Um, otherwise it can get away from you. Yeah, that's a huge value add. Do you want to do a couple of rapid fire questions? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Whatever you want. All right. So who do you admire professionally and why? Yeah. Um, I admire generally um, people who have a very strong uh, point of view and a kind of an unyielding um, uh, like attachment and perspective to that. So like Taleb would be a great example. Uh, Jeff Bezos. Um, 
uh, Gwen Shotwell, she's the CEO of SpaceX. Um, like people that just have like a super strong point of view on the on the world and just like a determination to kind of see that through, I think is um, the people that I'm drawn to. I love biographies. I read a ton of biographies. Um, uh, right now I'm reading The Power Broker, which is about Robert Morris and the, the fall of New York City. But th- those kind of personalities are, are very appealing to me. That's on my list. Yeah. I- iconoclast people. Yeah, exactly. Perfect word. Much more succinct. That's a better rapid fire <laughs> answer. Sorry, Alex. No, it's all good. If you could create your own category in Jeopardy, what would it be? And would you get every question right? I'll create my own category. Yeah, I mean, the easy one is like hacking growth. Um, and I think I would probably do fairly well there. No, I think that, but like a more. Um, so I used to play this baseball game as uh, like a uh, baseball game as a kid called pursue the pennant. It's like a statomatic. You basically have these cards, which have you roll three dice and those dice tie to baseball outcomes. And then every player on the field has a different distribution of those numbers to different outcomes based on how good they are. And the, all the players have ratings and attributes attached to them to kind of modify those outcomes. And for a very specific window of time from like 1988 to like 1993, almost every player in that set of cards, I can probably tell you what like their main attributes are. So I would go like pursue the pennant is the name of the game, 1988 to 93 player cards. I think I could nail that. I love, love the specificity. That's awesome. Yeah, so um, what kind of related, what talent would you most like to have? I wish I was a software engineer. I was like, that is the one thing that I have kind of like, I taught myself SQL. I've, dabbled in HTML and CSS and stuff. I even have taken a bunch of like Udemy app developer courses, but like never have really made it stick. And uh, if I had like unlimited time um, and like that would be the superpower I want because I think uh, the ability to bridge the gap from idea to stuff in real life, uh, a lot of it's covered by that capability and I don't have it. So yeah, you said Facebook required you to get quite a bit more technical, right? Yeah, 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 totally. Cause it's all, it's all metrics driven. It's very logical, rigorous uh, metrics driven. Uh, so like I learned SQL for that role. Um, you know, the experimentation platform is uh, insanely sophisticated. The data culture there is uh, insanely sophisticated. So um, yeah, that, that required a lot of like personal leveling up for me. Um, I thought I was good at metrics until I walked in there and then I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. So I was going to ask, because I, I feel like getting technical uh, engineering related skills, it's easy enough to tinker and like get the basics. But then like once you see somebody who's really good at it, you realize that, oh, wow, this is like a lifelong obsession and not necessarily something I could dabble in and hope to get anywhere near like master level at. It almost yep. reminds me of like like skiing or snowboarding. Like, of course, the first couple of lessons are going to suck and eventually you're yep. going to be able to stand up and go down basic hills. But then yep. if you look at Michaela Schifrin or somebody like that, you're like, oh, that's that's a different ball game. And yeah, that's how totally. I felt about technical stuff. Yeah, or like learning a language, playing an instrument, same kind of, you know, you can learn to order a coffee in a different language, but you want to like sit down and, you know, talk about someone's life story or ask a doctor a question in another language. It's kind of a different ball game. Yeah, but it's kind of cool. It, it's kind of a good reason to learn those things because then you yeah. you can respect like the um just the level that some people are operating at. Yeah, for sure. I totally agree. So yeah, that's but that's the one talent I wish I had. What do you consider the most overrated virtue? The most overrated virtue. Hmm. That's a good question. I I'm not going to answer your question exactly, but I think the most problematic uh, virtue is kind of the oversimplification of most things, almost down to like straw man arguments, where the it kind of goes back to your different, like the un- how well you actually understand something versus what you think you understand about something, right? And so I think. Um, much like software engineering, like you try it out and then you like realize that you're, you know, you're playing chopsticks on the piano instead of Mozart, like kind of a completely different thing. I think um, people have a very reductionist view and an oversimplification, like an oversimplifying filter, and then put a very strong moralistic lens on top of an oversimplified view of reality. And then kind of like, 
argue virtue from like that standpoint uh, without like, and maybe this goes back to like my type five Enneagram, but like actually really understanding and pulling apart the layers of like what's happening, the why really understanding it. And then, you know, kind of like withholding judgment until you get down to that layer. Um, so it's not an exact answer, but that's the thing that I think is the most overrated is people taking service level observations, making hard judgment calls uh, on them with, uh, with like poor second order and order kind of, uh, understanding or thinking behind it. I totally agree. I don't know what that would be called, but I, it sounds like what you would replace it with is some form of like epistemic humility or intellectual honesty or some, yeah. some ability to say, oh, actually, I don't, I don't totally know. And like to yeah. be comfortable in that ambiguity in that like unclear area and actually say, Hey, there's some nuance here. Yeah, totally. And I find myself doing that all the time. It's just being like, you know, I don't know the right answer. I think part of the problem of like writing a book or whatever is like people think that you come with answers like built in. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, being like, no, actually, I don't know the answer here. I'm like, I have trust in a process of how we can get to the answer. Um, but I can't give you the answer right off the right off the bat. Yeah, you almost need to like, have, I mean, you could be this person or, or other people could, but you almost need to have like a couple people be the first to be courageous to say, I don't know, and to train others that it's okay to say that too. So yeah. I almost feel like you get in, into meetings or a company culture or whatever context, and everybody's just afraid to look like the dumb one, you know, or like yeah. the one who says they don't know. And then as soon as somebody does, everybody, you could feel like the collective sigh in the group. Yeah. Like, totally. oh, okay, cool. We can yeah. be honest. Totally. And I actually think the inverse is really dangerous where people use the word no, like they'll say like, I know, or we know in a very lazy way, right? Like it's very easy to say, I know something. Um, and it, but it's also very easy for that to be not true or like incomplete, right? And so one of the, one of the interesting things I learned at Facebook was the specificity of your answer really matters, right? So um, I have heard as like a bad heuristic, like we'll run an A-B test experiment. And someone will say, well, we know from that experiment that X, Y, Z is true. And it's like, time out. You do not know that to be true based on that experiment. What you do know is that your intervention caused this outcome or is correlated with this outcome, maybe not even cause, mm -hmm. it's correlated to this outcome. But that does not infer a broader knowledge of like this thing that you just generalized it to, right? So a very specific example, um, like at Facebook, you know, we run a bunch of user research surveys and a bad way to frame uh, a research result would be, we know that most parents are okay with their kids using iMessage uh, on their phones. Um, that has two awful assumptions in it. Most, or maybe three bad assumptions on it. Uh, most uh, adults, and are okay are okay with yeah all of those are super ambiguous terms um which can get which can reach a really bad outcomes if like uh, processed wrong and, and generalized wrong and so like we would talk really specifically there be like 27 percent of us adults 35 to 47 who are iphone owners are okay with their kids aged 8 to 10 with occasional use of iMessage to communicate with friends and family, period. Like, and then okay would be defined as n number of hours or n number of contacts or a particular like qualitative assessment of like that use of time. And so that was much more specific in terms of being real about what we knew. And then you couldn't really generalize that. You couldn't generalize that to Android users. You couldn't generalize that to people in different age ranges. But I, one of the, the bad kind of, uh, logical errors people make is using this broadly encompassing we know statement usually from like an anecdote that maybe supports some part of that statement but doesn't encapture the broad totality of it and then that anecdote itself often has its own problems and so then you end up with this like collective tribal group think knowledge of we know when it actually is built on very specious understanding um, that doesn't stand up to any kind of like reasonable investigation. And so like beating the shit out of that, out of organizations is like super important. 
Man, I'm I'm kind of frustrated I asked that question, or at least this late, because yeah, you yeah. just opened up like this whole rabbit hole and you've got my mind turning. It's like this kind of hobby horse of mine, in information theory or epistemology, or the question of like how we know what we know. That's yeah. like the art of experimentation in in a nutshell. So yeah, yeah I would I would have an hour-long conversation about that by itself. We'll have to, we'll have to do it again sometime. <laughs> For sure. So I'll do one more quick one cool. um, and then we can, we can uh, bust out. But what kind of blogs and podcasts and influencers are you following nowadays? Yeah, I think um, two types. So one is like people writing about emergent stuff that is like on the radar. That's super interesting to me that feels like um, directionally important. So um, like not boring by Packy McCormick, uh, the diff by Bryn Howard, um, a lot of like sub stacks related to kind of creator economy, cryptocurrency, NFTs, the metaverse, all that stuff is kind of like the next five to 10 years is very interesting to me. Like the general idea of like the, the big ideas of tomorrow start out looking like toys today is like one area that I just in my general fascination. The second one is really uh, the fundamentals of the space that I'm in. Uh, these are more like research papers and um, presentations, conference talks, more of the dry, boring stuff to actually like, like build that subject matter expertise in customer acquisition, right? Because they kind of sit at this intersection of customer acquisition and product process operations and general management. And so building like as much depth as I can, particularly around customer acquisition, privacy, attribution, media mix modeling, just reading a lot of scientific papers on, on that to kind of like boot up my, my knowledge as, as fast as possible there. So those are kind of the two streams. And then iconoclast, okay. iconoclast <laughs> reading on the, the biography side. Yeah, I love it. Um, all right, cool. Well, this has been amazing. Is there anything else you would like to say before we, uh, before we go? Otherwise, where can people find you online? Yeah, um, they can find me online at Twitter. I'm at Morgan B online morganbrown.co um if you're looking for a gig shopify.com slash careers always looking for talented uh, growth people to join to join our crew and make commerce better for everyone everywhere awesome thank you morgan this is super cool. fun thanks alex super fun to wrap out with you i appreciate it